Uh, so then once you make these measurements, you know, you apply this regression and you correct your model. Um, and it's not clear here, at least what the model was before, but uh, presumably some of these bloom pathways were modified. Um, okay, so this is just kind of going over the same steps that I just described in a more visual way. You grow your cells with the labeled substrate, um, and you know you you can do that for varying lengths of time. Um, you, you use these measurement techniques and you estimate your fluxes. Um, and this shows, I think, the Metran interface, Professor Antonio Witch uses. I've already covered this. You're really just trying to find a distribution of fluxes across your network that minimizes the difference. You can't just do it individually because then they won't you know, go together. So you're doing this for the sum of all of these reactions. So more about isotopomers. Um, I think that we've already defined them before, I hope. Um, isotopic isomers, maybe I didn't say that part, is what this um, is a concatenation of. Um, so isomers of metabolite that differ only because of their labeling state. And uh, effectively, there's always two N isotopomers possible, assuming that you're using one of two different states. And you probably don't want to in introduce more complexity than that at least not for, for metabolic engineering analyses. And so here's this idea of this binary code we just talked about, um, and you can uh, represent information vectorially. Here's that playing out again. You can clearly see the two to the n here. Um, and this is the vector representing that. Um, your isotopomers can be mixed in different ways. Uh, when you've got two pathways just entering into a common metabolite, uh, you could go from a pathway that's exclusively in one form uh, and one that's in another, and then they just mix. Uh, or when there are reactions taking place, and this is really the key behind uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the utility of 13C labeling, is that you get covalent bonds that form that, that result in effectively exchange and, and uh, specific patterns or fingerprints um, for which the ratios of these different species can indicate um, different fluxes. So, um, you know, these isotopomers uh, are somewhat indirect in measurement. We use um, NMR and mass spec really just to get um, masses or patterns of larger molecules um, than, than the individual atoms themselves, but often fragments of um, the metabolites that we may be interested in. So I'll explain that better in a moment. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. So what I'm getting towards is a fragmentation pattern, and here it is for phenylalanine. So if you imagine a technique like GCMS, um, gas chromatography is performing a chromic chromatographic separation uh, based on the interaction of, you know, your species within a mobile phase to a column. Um, and then there's a subsequent mass spectrometry stage. So what's shown here is before you go even into the GC step, say if you have a metabolite like phenylalanine or other amino acids, um, you perform this chemical derivatization. Um, so see this group here um, is attached to the amine, and this group here is attached to the carboxylate. And then uh, after your species has gone through the GC, uh, it would be fragmented like in any other kind of mass spec operation. And so you get a characteristic M over Z for each of these fragments. And here you can see this GC um, EI, which stands for electrospray ionization, mass spec spectrum of this modified phenylalanine. And so you can do this just as one mass spec step, or you can do subsequent additional mass spec uh, steps in tandem. And this isn't only specific for looking at isotopomers, for example. Um, you might want to do this in general just to get better identification of uh, not necessarily metabolites because their fragmentation patterns are relatively simple, but this is standard. This is the standard for um, 
peptide and often protein analyses because you can break up a protein first, um, usually using an enzymatic process like a triptych digest into smaller fragments. And then you might apply um, an additional step uh, of mass spec so that you get sub fragments. Um, okay, so uh, this process is also called collision induced dissociation. And so you can see um, these what are called here daughter mass isotopomer distributions. Um, and uh, these different techniques, for example, um, cause different fragments, uh, ultimately of smaller and smaller fragments. And so I know I've been rambling for some time, but this is the last slide about this. And I wanted to sort of wrap up 13C flux analysis and then uh, take questions. One of the key things that's been going on here the whole time is that we don't think that the 13C affects how an enzyme would behave. Um, and you know, also that uh, effectively bond formation and bond breakage is random and independent too. And so it's important to realize that that's pretty well established for some isotopes. And part of that has to do with, you know, um, as a percentage of the overall molecular weight or mass, you know, what, what is the difference for these isotopes? And, and it's a simplification because it may be actually that within a particular binding pocket of an enzyme, structurally, three-dimensionally, um, not electrostatically, because that shouldn't really matter, um, that shouldn't be affected by the addition or not of a neutron, uh, but you, you may find that in reality there, there could be an enzyme active site that really doesn't want to accommodate, uh, we're talking about such a sub-angstrom level change here, it's, it's hard to believe. Um, but if we think about it in mass relative to the overall molecule, difference between 13C and 12C is 8%. So the kinetic isotope effect, if people have looked into this, is pretty small. However, if you use deuterium, that's a different story. Um, because when you're talking about uh, deuterium versus normal hydrogen, you've got a twofold difference in mass, and people have observed, actually, that the kinetic isotope effect can be as high as sevenfold. So that then really challenges this assumption. You may find and measure that more flux is going through a particular pathway or likely less flux when you use your isotope. Uh, and and it, there may have been a lot that you convoluted there uh, by using the deuterium. So I want to pause here now and ask if there are any questions about 13C metabolic flux analysis in general.